It's time for a new evolution in raising golfers, one that doesn't involve headaches, tears, or heading down the path of unknown. Whether you're trying to introduce children to the game of golf, help them play competitively, or play at a collegiate level, you're in the right place. This show is for any parent, player, or coach who wants to build a better team at home and on the golf course. This is the Raising Golfers Podcast. All right. Hey, what's up, everybody? Good to have you back this week. We've got an excellent interview coming up here in just a moment. But first and foremost, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's been going on here and my coaching life. And we've been running these Operation 36 group classes, and we had our first nine-hole event two weeks ago and it was a blast just getting the families out on the golf course and man they had so much fun it was just it was just crazy to see and and success and even just opportunities to have a birdie on the very first time they're on the golf course i mean you wouldn't believe what kind of thrill and excitement all of these children had on the golf course so it was just so much so much fun we also have been doing these preschool classes and we had a really cool class this last week where we had golfosaurus he was the character in the book that we were reading and we had all kinds of fun activities to really help get these preschoolers engaged into the game of golf and really have them just immersed in the game and learning golf without even really knowing that they're learning golf so today my first question for you is is what are you waiting for to get your children into preschool golf classes so if you are a golf coach listening or if you're a parent out there listening and you've got a young one and you're a little bit timid about getting your preschooler into the game of golf, this episode's going to be an amazing listen for you. Our guest today, Nicole Weller, she's a golf coach and she specializes in this age group. Today she's going to share with us how to best connect with young children as a coach and help us parents better understand why these classes for children of this age group are so important. Now, Nicole's background in education is in youth golf and sports psychology. If we can have the kids understand emotional management at an early stage, imagine what they're going to be like at age 20, right? So I'll ask them something like, all right, before you putt this, um, how do you want to feel? And, you know, it could be happy or excited or, you know, fun like that. And I'll say, what color is that? So they might say, oh, happy is going to be green. So, you know, as as we talk to adults, in spite of the result, how can you manage that emotion that you bring into the shot, not inherit? So I want you to be in a good place despite what happens. And that is owning yourself. We're going to bring her into this episode, and I can't wait to share this with you all. Nicole, welcome to the Raising Golfers podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me on board, Travis. Yeah, I'm excited. And you were highly recommended from Lynn and Pia from Vision 54. And they said, I got to have you come Mm -hmm. on to the podcast. So this is going to be exciting. And we're going to talk about things that I believe we are both very passionate about, which is junior golf. Excellent. Yeah, Pia and Lynn, they're amazing. So uh, wonderful people, a lot of good energy there. Oh, uh, I've taken so much away from from everything they've taught me. And um, yeah, just a great resource. So I'm curious about you. How did you get into the game of golf? Uh, You know, my dad, um, both my parents came overseas from Europe. Uh, My dad was um, from the French part of Switzerland. And around when I was age four, he started taking up the game. So um, we moved on to a a really cool golf course in Lakeville, Massachusetts by the 10th fairway. It was called the Heritage Hill Country Club back then and a beautiful par three. So he started learning the game and I started tagging along and chasing butterflies and pulling his push cart. And then it led into some golf clubs and it grew from there. That's cool. And so have you basically played golf continuously since that point? I have. And I think defining play has changed over the years. So, you know, it's gone into starting and amateur and then competition. And now as a teacher, you know, I get to play and hit shots with students. So it's um, definitely, so it's, it's been a big part of my life. Very cool. Now, I'm also curious is, you know, when did you begin your niche in coaching ages from two to six year olds? Because that's something I'm actually getting into myself, but I also think it's a vital part of, you know, growing the game of golf. Uh, Back at the Landings Club in Savannah, Georgia was probably when I really started that. So um, I've always liked working with kids. I did a lot of babysitting growing up in our neighborhood and did the 4-H and learned a lot about it. But back in um, in Savannah, probably in 2007, 8-ish, right around there, I was working with youth golfers anyway, but I started doing four to five-year-olds and then 
working more with two to three year olds. So that became such a fun entity there at the club. And I remember even one July 4th weekend, we had 18 two to three year olds show up for an hour class. It was awesome. No way. Three pros, parents. It was like a huge golf fest. I loved it. That's cool. So what kind of learning curves did you go through as a coach when you started coaching those age groups? Because, you know, we could agree that they are a little bit different to coach than your, let's just say, eight to 10 year old junior golfer. Yes, they, they, I think the kids at that age are definitely learning about life. They don't have, um, you know, the ability to say no or manage their behavior yet. So I like learning that we need to have one adult per child handy, um, especially dealing with, you know, restroom issues and uh, meltdowns or excitement in one area and not wanting to move on. So having a parent there or a grandparent is super helpful. Um, I am a very structured person, so I've learned to adapt and have plans B, C, and D ready as well. <laughs> so um, I think it's really it's really good to morph into things, have something ready, but then have other activities ready. And you know, if the child likes what they're doing, um, not to rip them out of that area because it's time to do something else. So um, it's more of like guided guided discovery rather than hardcore lesson structure. Mm, yeah, I think that's great. I, I I like that a lot. And I've been talking about this a lot with other coaches with some of my adult students and then also just parents of junior golfers that, you know, that the importance of self-discovery and self-awareness is huge. And it's something I think I've missed on as a coach for mm -hmm. quite some time. And it's something I'm progressively working on, but I think mm -hmm. it, it's just so big for their, the, the quality of their development, not only just in golf, but also with life, which I think is, is pretty cool and very interesting. Mm -hmm. So with, with, with that discovery, you know, what kinds of activities or things do you do that kind of help bring that out of children in these golf classes? Well, imagine if you were bringing a child or for people who are listening, if they have a grandchild to a class, um, what would you expect for, um, you know, walking into a kindergarten classroom versus a high school classroom or a college classroom? So you'll see colorful activities, you'll see things that are tactile. Um, so you want a lot of activities that provide free play. So um, I love using the Littlest Golfer first club set for ages two to three. They are so light, molded grips, easy to use. And then I merge into the U.S. Kids Clubs as we get along into the four-ish, sometimes three, four, five-year-old range. So as far as the clubs, the colors, having things that are scaled down for the kids, I have these really cool tiny rakes that are about two feet tall. And uh, the, the, so the kids can actually go rake the bunkers. Um, we stop at the ball washers, but having a setting that is ready for them. Um, for adults, we've been adults so long. I think sometimes, you know, we've maybe forgotten how to be kids and what it's like to be two feet tall. So scale things and colorful things and having it where they have choice, like where they want to go putt here, or maybe they want to go putt at this game first. I think that's really cool. And and letting the kids have their first experience versus your 250th. I think that is really important. Mm, yeah, I, I like that analogy. It's so true, isn't it? Right. It's like um, mm -hmm. I've had some parents or either even coaches when I was coaching golf in China before this, we, we worked together at our academy. And so some of my students would then go and have some lessons or have supervised mm -hmm. practices with other coaches. And a lot of times there'd be that kind of like eagle eye on certain technical aspects of their game. And it was kind of like they were coaching them, like you said, with their 250th lesson as opposed to their first, right? And it's like they're looking at these mm -hmm. things that really aren't so important to the overall development of this child, right? Whether it's in golf or just, you know, from a, um, a hand-eye coordination uh, perspective or not. So I, I think that analogy is great. I think that's great. <laughs> I love you. that one. Thank yeah, that's, that's a good one. I'm going to use that, by the way. Okay, feel free. <laughs> yep, we all share and care. I like it. Thanks. That's cool. So... Now, then why is starting golf so early for these toddlers important in their development? You, you know, it's, um, I, I think it's important that the kids get to explore life and we're exploring life through golf. So it's very holistic. I, I really love a lot of what Kate Tempesta does. It's really about the whole child. Um, and so we're giving them a chance to learn about life lessons and manners and all the things that we take for granted. You know, even how to shake hands, which during COVID has been kind of challenging. We were doing fist bumps, but, you know, looking at a person's eye color 
and then giving them a medium hand squeeze, you know, making it into a game. And that's how kids learn is through the game. So um, other sports have figured out how to work all this in for the kids. And golf's been kind of traditional game. And sometimes I've heard of courses where if you're under the age of eight or 10, you can't come to the range. You can't be on premises or doing things um, because of the, um, the atmosphere. So if we can find a way to keep tradition going without stifling the progress, I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, definitely important to have have the kids out there learning and and learning in a way that helps them as well as respects what's going on within within the um, the club. So yeah, and then to follow up with that, what what have you seen then over the years? Have you seen by starting toddlers or younger golfers in golf early on? Mm-hmm. Have you seen them stay in the game longer because they've started sooner and they've had these fir- these first experiences have been so positive? Yes, for sure. And um, the, the ways that they're staying in vary. I've had people say, remember when Jack was in your class as four-year-old, he's now playing on the middle school team. He's playing junior league. Um, he, you know, he shot 40 the other day. So we're hearing stories like that where the kids are in and they might not be, you know, top of the line, but they're, they're having fun in their own way. And it's, it's, it's what's working for them. And others come back and just visit every year and just do like um, a, a visit golfs in their life, but it is kind of a, a side activity. So I think it, um, it helps them to get involved in the game at very different aspects. And we do see them going on with that. Um, I think it's important not to experience burnout. That is so huge um, at an early stage. And Sometimes we drill down to the smallest little thing. We get so much into the small picture and coaches and parents get into the small picture versus the big picture, right? They're five. I mean, they might be competing, but oh my gosh, they're five years old, you know? So rationally their, their minds haven't even developed yet, but um, I think it's really important to keep them remember that they're kids and we'll see them stay in the game longer and really enjoy a lot of family golf. Yeah, I think that's something that I've thought about a lot as well is just how to be patient with the process and that there is time. We actually did a podcast episode and it was titled There Is Time because mm-hmm. I, I mean, you might agree with this, you know, as adults, both parents and coaches, we go, we try to go from zero to 60 with the the child's progress way too fast. And then, mm-hmm. you know, it might get ahead of their interest levels and start training and coaching and talking to these young golfers like they're two professionals but really you know who they are is different than what they do and they aren't two professionals they're still children they are but kids are growing up so fast right you know and we live in an age of we want things right away yeah how do how, how would you what kind of advice would you give listeners whether it's parents or coaches you know on how to kind of slow yourself down and kind of slow down some of those expectations and slow down some of the uses of words and actions you might have with children so that they can continue just to enjoy it over time? Um, I think with any golfer, honestly, um, you know, saying, okay, what if we would do this and asking them, what does that mean to you? What's it like? And they may come up with the silliest little story about what it means to them. Um, you know, like talking about a landing area for chipping, you know, with an eight year old and they're like, oh, we're going to land it on the pizza. And what kind of toppings are on your pizza? And will the ball stick on the cheese? And so, you know, who would have talked talked about a landing area being a cheese pizza, but it's, I think it's talking on the kids level. Um, That's why I wrote my book. um, Let's play golf because I'm hearing adult verbiage with the kids. So one, two, show my shoe using a rhyme, tick tock, swing the clock and having fun with the kids is important and defining fun varies from person to person. So what I think is fun, a four-year-old may not think is fun. Right. So it's it's figuring out what what is engaging to them, involving them, giving them some options. And I think it's important to get with a Positive Coaching Alliance. I absolutely love that program. They have a super um, parent portal and, and have some great ideas for how a parent can just help a child even get to the next level. And that's that's really what we all want for the kids. And we all even the parents who and the grandparents who seem a little intense it's, it comes from a good place in the heart, but the way it comes out is sometimes not matching the child's goals. So, um, you know, um, I've seen helicopters and lawnmower and, and parents who kind of, um, they hover a little bit and they like to do things for the kids and uh, probably more than is needed. So the kids don't really learn how to develop themselves. 
they rely on uh, on the adult advice so let the kids be kids guided exploration let them come up with their own answers and um let them discover totally agree yeah the positive coaching alliance i actually just took the double goal coach certification what do you think oh it was amazing it was awesome and uh in last week's episode I actually just did an episode called Dear Parents, and it's just kind of a letter, that a verbal letter that I'm writing out to parents to help continue to encourage all the parents keep doing the good things that they're doing and kind of summarize some of these things that have been talked in previous episodes, but then also things that are from the Positive Coaching Alliance. And so if you're a parent or a coach listening to this episode, go check out this. this I mean, it's just a great resource for everybody really. And the, the online trains are really cool with the audio, uh, the, the videos that they put together. It, it's just awesome. So I, I think that's great advice there that you bring up now back Thank to you. toddler What's your golf. Mistake ritual? <laughs> What's my mistake ritual? Yeah. Is that, is that yeah. what you're asking me? <laughs> well, yes. that that's a good question. So that's something that I would say that I am working on. But I think for me, I think I've actually done this other thing where it's like counting backwards from five. That also seems to Mm -hmm. kind of calm me and help me get back to uh, where I was. So those are some little things that I've done, but it still needs a lot of improvement. (laughs) It's fun to explore. Yes. Yes. Good. So now back to toddler golf, I've got a, a, a question. And why do you think adults because you brought this up as well. So why do you think adults, and that would be parents and coaches, are a little bit timid about getting toddlers into golf? And they say, oh, you got to be you got to be six years old before, you know, taking golf lessons. You've got to be eight before you come out and practice and play. But why do you think us adults are so timid in getting toddlers into the game? Uh, you know, because I think that they're thinking in it in, this, in the style of adult golf. And this is near golf experience. So, um, you know, it's like with the training wheels on. So I think it's important to to let them know, you know, we've got to do something that looks like golf. So we're using big eight to 10 inch plastic balls to hit. Um, we're going around, you know, using um, little little animations or little toys on the green to make it. So I think some people aren't comfortable with that age group. Um, and that's understandable. Everybody has their own niche, right? Um, sure. How to speak two, three, four, five-year-old versus a teen. Um, so the style there, and, and I'm, I'm really up for it. If it's not your style, that's cool, but find somebody who can help you with that because that is a huge, um, you know, part of the team. Maybe it's a school teacher who has summer off or um, wants to help out a little bit or a parent who's very good with that. Um, so I think it's just comfort level, to be honest, Travis, and, and then um, not having the right props or, um, you know, feeling good with that, with that age group that is so shifty and not, not really able to listen. I once had a person say, well, I don't think they, they have the attention span that I need. And I'm thinking, well, maybe you don't have the attention span they need. And so it's kind of like, um, you know, who's comfortable with that. So, um, I don't know. I just, I just gravitate to that age group. And I think it's important to find somebody who can help you on the team that who's comfortable with that. What about, you, you talked about some do's and don'ts, so you've mm-hmm. already gone over that, but what about competition? W- what would you say would be the right time to get a junior golfer into competition? Uh, you know, based on all the fun ADM models and um, where we see research showing kids getting going, um, I like seeing uh, a little bit more serious competition, more in middle school-ish. Obviously, there are opportunities out there for kids to start younger, and I wonder sometimes if it's the parents competing you know, like lining up the child's putter, teeing it up to certain heights so it's perfect. Um, so sometimes that that's a little disturbing, you know, to see how intense it can get. So if it's a fun event, I'm good with that. So um, that's a tough question because of how society has kind of grown. It's, it's a really double-edged sword, Travis. Mm. So I, I like seeing kids progress a little bit more when they when they can get out and uh, do things on their own and they're having fun. Mm-hmm. I think it's how the, the child reacts. So if they're enjoying it, great. But if they're constantly looking over the shoulder for approval or they hit a shot and they don't know how to manage it, they're not they're not ready to own that experience yet. You know, they're having somebody else's experience and trying to figure out how to deal with that. And 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 honestly, the emotions that come with that, it's that's a big baggage, you know. 
too. Oh, 100%. I agree. Yeah. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but I used to help run one of the uh, U.S. kids golf local tours right. in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it was a lot of fun. It was great. And yeah. um, I, I really enjoyed it. And I think once everybody kind of got on the same page, and that was the staff running the event, the parents who were caddying, and then the players, right. things went very smooth. And it was a really good experience for everyone. That's for sure. Yeah. Yes. So now I know that you have a sports psychology background, don't you? I do. Yeah. My master's degree is in sports psychology. That's, that's, that's really cool. And this is, I think this is something that is becoming more and more popular in the game of golf, especially is things related to sports psychology. What I'm curious about though, is how is sports psychology applied to young golfers? You know, it's it's really fun to, to do that in, in a game format. So I very much enjoy um, uh, Vision 54, of course, and uh, Tim Creamer is a good friend of mine, and he initially had Spirit of Golf, and now it's Peak Performance Mind Coaching, but it deals more with the emotional aspects, Travis, which I find really intriguing. People think it's the mental game, and to me, the mental and the emotional game are separate. So let's say that I'm working with a youngster. I could even be as young as age four and five. If we can have the kids understand emotional management at an early stage, imagine what they're going to be like at age 20, Hmm. right? So I'll ask them something like, all right, before you putt this, um, how do you want to feel? And, you know, it could be happy or excited or, you know, something, you know, fun like that. And I'll say, what color is that? So they might say, oh, happy is going to be green. And I'm like, all right, can you make a big green bubble? Oh, grow it bigger. Let me see how big you can get that green bubble. So if I was over there, I'd want to see it all around you. And then I said, I want to see, can you putt and keep the green bubble around you? No matter what happens on the putt. So, you know, as, as we talk to adults, in spite of the results, how can you manage that emotion that you bring into the shot, not inherit? So I want you to be in a good place despite what happens. And that is owning yourself. So I guess with the young kids coming into it with some games like that is really cool. I like that. That's a great activity. I've never thought about that. So then what would be the follow up then after they hit those putts? What, what kinds of questions do you ask them after they've, they've, you know, gotten into the activity a little bit? I might say, um, I'd say, how, how big is that? I'm seeing a little green, but how big can it get? You know, and they can, can they make it really big? I'll say, did that bubble pop? Can we go back and do it again? Almost like, you know, blowing bubble gum and seeing how big you can make that again. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of, um, asking, checking in on it. And then, you know, we may work on growing it again, or maybe a different shade of green just to see how their awareness is. Maybe it was bright green if they really did it. And then it's now a lighter green. So um, I I think colors, visual, especially for kids are are, are really good. And then um, I do, I would follow up. I just thought of this. Um, I might test it. Thanks to you. But having them draw some pictures of themselves golfing. I love having kids work with art and music and Play-Doh and creativity, right? Do a lot of that, but maybe have a picture of them playing with their green bubble around them. So that could be really good too. Oh, I like that. I, mm-hmm. uh, I had a guy, he's a coach in Spain. His name's Jonathan Ochoa. And he said one activity he did was he had them actually just draw a picture of a golfer that they saw in a book or in a, mm-hmm. um, it might've been Tiger Woods from like uh, some video clip. So he had them all draw the picture of what they thought the image looked like. And he said, the drawings all looked very different, right? But it was there, they owned the drawing, right? And then they had, he had them take mm-hmm. the drawing out on the golf course. And he said, all right, now just try to do the, make the exact same swing that you just drew up. And he said, all of a sudden there was these kids who like really could never even like make what looked like a swing before. All of a sudden they just started swinging. And he said, it was like this amazing right. thing that he didn't even expect to have happen. And it, there must've been that connection because of just, you know, seeing it, drawing it, and then applying it. Mm-hmm. And he said the results are phenomenal. So I think I need to add some of that stuff into my coaching as well. And I like that idea that you brought in too. That's great. Thanks. Nice. Yeah, yeah, kids are so visual, Travis, you know, I mean, think about when Tiger started, he was in the playpen, right? Mm-hmm. Watching golf on TV. Mm-hmm. So the kids are so visual. And, um, you know, 10 seconds or less on verbiage is important showing them. So that's cool. So yeah, add more drawings in there and finger painting use Q-tips and put like blobs of paint on a uh, plastic paper, uh, paper plate, and then they can dip their um, Q-tip in and draw with that and then change colors. And it's, uh, it's fun for them. That's cool. If you were to summarize this and there was a parent that wanted to get their toddler or young golfer into golf, how would you explain to the parent that these are the activities that you are going to be doing where it's not like you said, the 250th lesson that they, that the adults had, 
but their first one. And yeah, how, how do you kind of get their buy-in and how do you explain this to them? Because I think this is something I, I would take away, but also for the parents listening as well, it'll give them a better understanding as well as what they should be expecting. Right. I think, you know, having your program laid out to here's what here's what our philosophy is, having like a, a mission statement in a way. So for this age group, based on research and how children develop, this is what we include. So, um, you know, some parents are going to ask for more technical and I'll say at this stage, here's what we're looking to do. And very much like you as kids, um, um, I'm working with uh, developing a pathway and I have cards now that I'm really piloting and experimenting with. So if you're two to three and, and we have a list of eight things, uh, they get a sticker every time they finish that little activity and they get to help me put the sticker on there. So I don't make that the big point because I'm much more into intrinsic reward than extrinsic reward for two to fives. But um, showing a parent what we're going to expect at that age group. And I would say, you know, if they were in school right now in kindergarten, they're going to be doing finger painting. They're going to be doing these kinds of things. I wouldn't expect them to do what a high schooler does. So um, I think laying it out, showing them what's on the card. And I just printed out um, a new what to expect as parent, how to become a better sport parent type card. And I have a front and back and I'm going to have those starting to hand out with classes. So that's cool. I like those ideas. That's great for the parents too, that, you know, that sign up for your program, they got something to take away and read through. And, and again, it mm -hmm. kind of gets everybody in the, on the same page and, and aligned mm -hmm. before even, you know, the child comes to the first class. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, you touched on some of your resources. I want to go into a little bit more detail about these because I'm very curious about them. So when did you come up with the idea to, you know, you wrote your first book and I know that you're mm -hmm. working on a, another one or two mm -hmm. and then also the cards. So yeah, mm -hmm. when did you come up with all this? Oh, uh, I would say roughly 2010 is when I, I started thinking about writing a book. I um, was listening to parents, grandparents, kind of on the range when I drove by working with the kids and the verbiage again was a little bit adult. And so um, I wanted to make it more fun. And so I decided, I don't know, I just sat down and started writing and writing and all of this stuff came out. And, um, you know, with rhymes, one, two, show your shoe, tick tock, swing the clock. So I wanted to put it all into game format and um, hired an illustrator and put the book together. And it was quite a project. I actually talked to Pia and Lynn about their book writing and Dana Rader and all, a lot of people um, about that. So I went with a self-publishing route and um, that was that was pretty cool. Have stickers in the back as, as rewards or points so they can be used in classes with coaches who want to, you know, maybe have two teams um, uh, and have the kids, you know, especially at age like five, six, seven, eight, have more have the points for the teams. It's um, uh, really important to have less competition and more team events for the younger ages. So you could do that in the classes. And, and then the flashcards came about in 2014 where I just took the images and um, I made double images of a tee or a ball or a warm up or a rake or whatever. And so after they learned the terms, we put them all down face down and then find the matching pictures. So that's always a great rainy day project or it was a good COVID project. And I just um, had them reprinted freshly here. So now they're available really easily where they're really nicely done the great cover card and I have those ready to go and um, yeah my new book actually coming out has been a request of people who read my quote of the day on my Facebook page and they're like this stuff's great from what the kids say during the day so I organized it into a book by chapters maybe it's about putting or random stuff but it's just so funny and so at the beginning of each chapter are tips for parents to work with especially young youngsters um, and then the rest of the quotes are just, there's some hilarious stuff in there. <laughs> That's cool. I'm going to have to go back and look through, through those because it, it's funny, isn't it? What, what children can say and what they come up with. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's just, they're so brilliant that they, you know, they just have such a creative mind and then they, they just speak their, they just speak their they mind and, and the things that they say are just, just priceless, aren't they? So that's cool. So they I didn't are. know that was what the inspiration was for the second book. When, mm -hmm. when are you, when are you looking to release that book? I would say, well, I'm about to get a copy of the final and then we're working on just submissions and whatnot. So I'd like to say maybe end of June would be good. So okay. And that'll be available in a lot of resources. My first book, I'm probably going to come up with a version two and um, have that be able to get out there as well. So, um, but yeah. Very cool. And so as a parent, if a parent were to purchase this, uh, your, mm -hmm. your resources, how would you recommend mm -hmm. that they use them? 
Uh, great question. So I, I'm, I'm able to handle the orders directly through me and for them to use it, the cards are great. The parents, grandparents could use it at home, um, you know, during a rainy day um, at a time when maybe they're somewhere, stick them in the purse or backpack and they have to wait somewhere. Great to just pull those out and read them um, anytime in little bursts. Um, you know, kids can kind of listen in and then they get wiggly and want to move away. So little chapters, little bursts like that. The book is great for some bedtime reading, maybe read a page or so. Um, and I'll actually take the book out to the course in the range because they can do a lot of those fun things um, out there. And um, maybe even in the yard, just swinging and sticking the finish, that would get some points. And um, some of the things is what, when they're read, then they get a point. So they're great at home, great at the course, and the cards are great anywhere. That sounds awesome. So if uh, listeners wanted to purchase some of these resources, where would be the best place for them to go? Uh, the best place to do that, um, they could Facebook messenger me on Nicole Weller. Um, on my website, NicoleWeller.com, it'll say how to get in touch with me under my, my store and product there. Cool. Very cool. So Nicole, you've come on and shared a, a bunch of really valuable information for us regarding coaching young golfers and also just how to adapt some of that sports psychology into either coaching young golfers or as a parent, what you can actually do to actually kind of get them engaged and involved in activities such as golf very early on in a positive way and kind of bringing ourselves as adults down to their level and speaking their language, which I, I took a lot away from, from you today. And, um, and then lastly, you talked about your resources just to add in and add that extra value and education and engagement and immersion for the children into the game of golf. So I think that's really cool. Now, thank you. Before I let you go, I got one last question for you, which I ask everybody. And that is, what are your final words of inspiration for raising golfers? Mm, that's a really good question. I would say raise and encourage kids um, who are they're testing golf among other activities. There's a, there's a big world out there. Um, I, I wouldn't keep it as a very single, um, narrow-minded, one type of sport. Make sure golf is inclusive with other types of activities um, keep it fun and allow them to take the idea and grow it. So I think that's important to, to let them be involved, um, give them some options, have some parameters, but let them kind of help you along with that and see, see where the ideas go. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate your time. I know you've got a very busy schedule and you were able to come on and share so much valuable information for our listeners and myself. So thank you again for, for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Travis. All right. That was a very informative interview with Nicole Weller. And just a couple of takeaways here. First one is how important it is to understand why starting out so early in sports is just really, really vital for the development of not only just golfers, but just children. And like Nicole said in this interview, she said, well, other sports have figured out how to do it and get toddlers and uh, preschoolers into their programs. And for us in golf, we've got to kind of figure it out as well. And she's been doing an amazing job of that. I'm trying to do a little bit of this myself, and I definitely learned a lot from her in this episode and took a bunch of notes myself. And I hope you did as well. Now, I thought it was just so cool how she is able to apply sports psychology to even really young players. And that example that she gave of trying to get them with their expressions to feel something, whether it's happy or sad or excited, whatever it may be, but just give them kind of just a taste and an awareness of, you know, what their emotions are and what they're actually thinking and when they're, how they can apply that to their golf game and what they're doing while they're out there practicing these really fun classes that she offers. I'm gonna try a little bit of this myself and um, I, I just think it's such a vital part of education for young children. I also thought it was really important and this is something that I'm gonna be doing as well with my programs is just how to get everybody on board and understand what it is children of this age really need in a learning environment. And I think a lot of times, like she said, we kind of have to speak their language to them and we need to coach them like it is their first lesson, not their 250th. And I think a lot of times as adults, you know, I've been guilty of this many times, that we start treating the children in these golf settings a little bit too much adult-like. 
and not enough childlike. And that's something I'm going to be actively working on myself. And just that was just really, really sung home for me from her there in, the, in this interview. So if you haven't already, message her about ordering one of her books. She's got those two that are upcoming. She's got the one that's already out or a set of the cards for yourself. You and your young ones are really, really, really going to enjoy having them around as an additional resource to building life skills through golf.